Um, other actors like David Warner, Nigel Hawthorne, a really extraordinary array, and writers like Pam Jennings and Carol Churchill. It was an extraordinary space for 20 years. Um, so it's a delight to be able to, um, to remember that with an extraordinary play. I think it's really interesting. I think it speaks to now. It's of its time, but it also speaks to today, I think. It's um, about voyeurism and truth and the place that art and fiction has um, in, that, in that world and territory. So, I hope you enjoy it very much. Uh, when it's finished, it's about an hour, I think, um, then uh, Susan Croft from Unfinished Histories, which is a, um, an organisation that works to, uh, to, to record the, the histories that are less well known about alternative theatres in the post war period, is going to um, interview Fred for about sort of just 20 25 minutes. Um, to get some of those details down when we're recording it. I should say that we are recording this, this event. Um, and then after that, those of you who wish to stay and join us for a glass of wine and browse at the pictures and the other materials in the room, um, would be extremely welcome. That's enough. All right. Thank you very much to Fred and everyone else. Ladies and gentlemen, I consider it my duty at the very outset to describe to you the setting of this possibly somewhat peculiar, but I assure you, entirely true story. To be sure, there is a considerable amount of danger in telling true stories. Some are for the police, or possibly even the Crown Prosecutor might be listening. Nonetheless, uh, I can allow myself to take the risk because I know perfectly well they won't believe my true story. At least not in their official capacity. In reality, that is to say, unofficially, all of you, of course, including the prosecutor or policeman who may or may not be among us, know very well that I only tell true stories. Scout's honor. <laughs> well then, might I ask you to concentrate for a moment. Imagine, imagine yourselves in the drawing of a grand hotel suite, the kind where the bill will look as if it has been added up by a highwayman. Modern furnishings. Looks as if it's meant to be lived in. Do you get the picture? <coughs> On your left, just close your eyes and you'll see the room distinctly. And don't get discouraged now. You've got imagination just like everyone else, even if you don't believe you have. On your left, you can see a number of assorted tables, all pushed together, higgledy-piggledy. Are you interested in taking a look at an author's study? Very well, then. Step up a little closer. Disappointing, isn't it? But believe me, it's true. Even studies where minor authors work can look something like this. Piles of papers, a typewriter, manuscripts covered with closely written corrections in various colors, pencils, ballpoint pens, rubbers, a large pair of scissors, a dagger. Well, not there by mistake. 
<clears throat> Back of this mess, there's a small improvised bar. Brandy, whiskey, absinthe, red wine, and so forth. That doesn't tell us anything about the quality, the genius, or the greatness of the author we're dealing with here either. It doesn't tell us anything to his advantage, but then on the other hand, it doesn't tell us anything to his disadvantage either. However, you can reassure yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, on the right side of the room, you'll find everything neatly in place. Well, almost everything. I'll just get rid of this, uh, well, this piece of female clothing. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, throw it to the corner here. And, oh, Yes, I might as well put this revolver away in the desk drawer. <laughs> Large, comfortable sofas made to the latest design. Books scattered all over the place. On the walls, you can see paintings and photographs. So, well, I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out for yourself. The nicest thing, though, is the background to the whole thing. A large open door, a balcony, an enchanting view, quite in accordance with the price charged. A sunlit lake, which was covered only a few weeks ago with red and white sails, but is smooth as deep blue glass now. Behind that, hills, woods, and the foothills of the mountains. Twilight, the lakeshore deserted. All in all, a late autumn orgy of red and yellow. <laughs> There's still a little life on the tennis courts. And you can hear the tick tock of the ping pong players. Do you hear it? All right. Let us come back into the room and take a look at the two leading characters of our play. Let's start with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I'm one of the leading characters. I'm sorry about it, really, but that's the way it is. I'll be coming from a bedroom where I've obviously been Never mind, it's nobody's business really what I've been up to in there. It'll all be written up in certain newspapers anyway, in the evening papers or the tabloids. After all, what is there about me that you can't read in certain newspapers? My life is a mess. Confused, crazy, full of one scandal after another. There's no point in denying it. All I have to do is tell you my name, and you'll have it in a nutshell. Corbs. Yes, indeed. You heard it right once again. I am Maximilian Friedrich Corbs. Novelist, Nobel Prize winner, etc., etc. Portly, suntanned, and unashamed. All topped off with a big bald head. As far as my personal characteristics are concerned, I'm brutal. I get what I want. And I'm a hard drinker. You see, I'm honest with you. Even if I'm just summoning up the general impression everyone has of me anyway. Maybe it's true that that general impression, and maybe I really am the way I describe myself to you, exactly the way, ladies and gentlemen, you know me through the picture papers of the newsreels. The Queen of Sweden, at any rate, 
on the occasion of the presentation of the aforementioned Nobel Prize, was of the opinion that I fitted the description exactly. Uh, rather strange, too, because I was all dressed up in white tie and tails at the time. To be sure, though, I did manage to spill a glass of Bordeaux on the royal evening gown. <laughs> Quite by mistake, of course. Still, who knows anyone, least of all himself, there's no point in kidding myself. I, at any rate, know myself only fleetingly. And no wonder. The opportunities for getting to know oneself are few and far between. In my case, for instance, one of them occurred while I was zooming down a sheet of ice on Mount Kilimanjaro. Another at the moment I was being cracked over the head by the well-known Oh, well, you know whom I mean. A real Gothic Madonna. No, not the one in the bedroom next door. <laughs> Some other one. <laughs> well, that's nothing you can imagine for yourselves, and uh, pleasant dreams to you while you're at it, too. And now a word. Is there someone on the stairs? I just stood. You take that out of it. And now a word about my clothes. <coughs> Here too, I must apologize. Above all, to all the ladies in the room. I have uh, pajama bottoms on and an open dressing gown through which my uh, chest, uh, covered with white hair, is dimly visible. None of this can be conceived. In my hand, an empty glass. I'm on my way to the bar. But I stop short when I observe that a visitor seems to have found his way into my study. The fellow is soon described. Small, lower middle class, carries a briefcase under his arm. Looks a bit like an old traveling insurance salesman. There's really no need to describe him more closely in view of the fact he will be removed from the scene of action in a perfectly natural manner once our story has run its course, and consequently would be then of no more interest. But that's enough for now. The visitor begins to speak. We're ready to start. I feel honored to find myself in the presence of the world-famous writer, Maximilian Friedrich Combs. What the devil are you doing in my study? Your secretary, though, and I've been waiting over an hour. Who are you? Well, my name is Hoffer. Fert Gott Hoffer. That sounds vaguely familiar. Oh, you're the fellow who's been bombarding me with letters. Quite correct. Ever since you've been taking the baths here, Besides that, I've had a chat with the doorman every morning, not that that did me any good. Finally, I managed to ambush your secretary, a very severe young man. Theology student, or a church master, working his way through seminary. It was only my unwavering persistence that convinced him, finally, this meeting would be of the greatest significance for both of us, honoured master. Corpse is the name. You can skip that honoured master stuff. Honoured Mr. Corpse. Since you're here at the bar, you might just pass me the whiskey bottle. It's the one on the far left. Oh, certainly. Ah, oh. thank you. Care for one yourself? I'd rather not, thank you. Absa, Campari, uh, something else? No, thanks. You a teetotaler? No, just too careful. I am, after all, in the presence of a mental giant. Feel a little like St. George, just before his fight with the dragon. Catholic? Evangelical. I need another drink. <laughs> you want to take care of yourself. You could keep your advice to yourself. Oh, I'm from Switzerland, Mr. Coombs. <laughs> take a closer look at the room in which the poet creates his works. Writer. 
Oh, well, we wish the writer creates his works. Oh, books and manuscripts everywhere. Oh, Faulkner looks in his scrubbed to my dear cause. Thomas Mann to cause with admiration and respect. Thomas Hemingway to cause my best friend as ever earnest. Henry Miller, oh, to my soul my cause. It's only in love and in murder that we still remain sincere. <laughs> now the view, oh, what a superb sight. The length of the mountains beyond it, never changing clouds above it, and the sun just going down, glowing red. Impressive. You write too, uh, I'll read. Know your complete works by heart, teacher, bookkeeper, <laughs> retired. Used to work for Ursley Trust in Co in Edmondview near Hawk. Have a seat. Thanks very much. I'm a little scared of these old drawing chairs. A very luxurious apartment. They charge enough for it. Well, I can imagine, no, this is an expensive spa. Absolutely catastrophic for my means. Even though I live in the cheapest possible manner at the CDU rooming house. It was cheaper in Adelboden. In Adelboden? In Adelboden. I was in Adelboden too. Yes, you were at the Grand Hotel, Vilda Struble. I was in the Pro Senate to rest home. <laughs> My paths have crossed several times. For example, at the ski lift in St. Moritz and on the uh, promenade in Baden Baden. You were in Baden Baden too. I was. At the same time as I was there. At the Saloa home for Christian men. <laughs> I have to schedule my time pretty closely. I've been working like a slave, Mr. Uh, Hoffer. Fert Gott Hoffer. Mr. Hoffer. I have to deal with hundreds of thousands of people in my lifetime, so I can only spare a quarter of an hour for you. Now tell me what it is you want to make it short. You oh, have come with a very definite You purpose. want money, eh? I have none to spare for just anybody that came along. There's such an enormous number of people who are not writers and who are perfectly easy marks that I wish people would leave members of my profession in peace. Besides, the amount of the Nobel Prize is greatly exaggerated anyway. And now if you please, we will say goodbye. Oh, honored master. Corbs is the name. One of Mr. Corbs. Get out of here. You misunderstand me. I didn't come to you because I need money. But because, because, because ever since I retired, I have been employed in detective work. Oh. I see. That's a different matter altogether. Uh, let's take a seat again. This is a great relief for me. Well, then. So, you're employed by the police now. Oh, no, on the... Uh, Corpse is the name. Oh, I'm a Mr. Corpse. <laughs> I'm a private detective. Even when, when I'm still a bookkeeper, there were all sorts of things that I uncovered. I was honorary auditor for several companies. Yes, indeed, I even succeeded in having the town treasury of Vinville sent to jail for embezzling the uh, orphanage funds. And so, when I had retired and the savings of a lifetime were at my disposal, my wife having died childish, I made up my mind, under the influence of your books, to devote myself entirely to my hobby. My books? All your immortal books, I think they kindle my imagination. I read them with feverish suspense, absolutely overcome by the magnificence of the crimes you write about. See, I became a detective, somewhat the way in which a religious uh, person, you know, inspired by the masterful way in which the devil does his work, might become a priest, uh, even though everything he does calls forth an equally powerful reaction. And now, good heavens, here I am, sitting next door to a Nobel Prize winner, the sun going down behind the mountains, and you drinking whiskey. Well, poetic, it 
predations, my dear. But no, it's entirely due to reading your books. I'm sorry to hear it. <laughs> You're wearing rather cheap clothes. Your new profession doesn't seem to have turned out very well for you. Well, it's true that life isn't exactly a bed of roses. The Crown Prosecutor is a friend of mine. I'll put in a good word for him. What uh, particular branch of criminology are you specializing in? Espionage? Divorce? Narcotics? The white slave trade? Literature. In that case, I must ask you for a second time to leave this room and once. Oh, well, honored, sir. You have become a critic. Now, if only you would permit me to explain. Get out. Yes, sir. I've only analyzed your works with respect to the criminological aspect. Oh, I see. In that case, you can stay. <laughs> I've been interpreted from psychoanalytic, Catholic, Protestant, existential, Buddhist, and Marxist viewpoints, but never from the viewpoint which you've adopted. Yeah, I owe you an explanation on it, Master. Corpse is the name of Mr. Cruz. <laughs> I've read your works because of a certain theory which I have formed. If whatever exists in the world of fiction, in your novels, must also exist in reality. Because it seems to me impossible to invent something which does not exist somewhere in reality. Fair to reasonable conclusion. Yeah, as a result of this conclusion, I began to look in real life for the murders described in your novels. You assumed that there was some sort of connection between my novels and reality. Exactly. I proceeded to use razor sharp logic. First, I subjected your work to a searching analysis. You see, you are not only the most notorious and newsworthy writer of our time, a man whose divorces, love affairs, alcoholic excesses, and Tomato Hunts have written up in all the newspapers and scandal sheets. But you are also known as the creator of the most beautiful murder scenes in world literature. I have never glorified murder, I say. I always try to show man as a whole. A part of the whole, of course, is the fact that he is capable of committing murder. Yeah, I was speaking as a detective, I was not interested so much in what you tried to do as in fact what you did do. It before you. Well, it was universally considered something horrible. But you have managed to bring magnificence and beauty even to this dark side of life, or, or rather of death. You are universally known as old sudden death and homicide. That's just a mark of my popularity. Uh, and of your skill in creating genuine master murderers whose identity no one can ever guess at. You're referring to my... Uh idiosyncrasy of letting the criminal escape unmasked. Exactly. In other words, you read my novels as if they were police reports. As if they were homicide reports. Your heroes murder no matter for profit or for thwarted passion. They murder for psychological gratification, for pleasure, for display their skill, or to increase their range of experience. All of them motives not recognized by traditional criminological theory. You are quite literally too deep, too subtle for the police or the uh, crown prosecutor. Consequently, they don't even suspect that a murder has been committed as far as they are concerned. As far as they are concerned, where there is no motive, there is no crime. If one assumes then that the murders which you describe really took place, it follows that they must have appeared to the public to be suicides, accidents, or even natural deaths. Yes, that follows, and logically speaking. Exactly what they appear to be to the people in your minds. Exactly. At this point in my investigations, I seem to find myself to be somewhat like that Spanish knight, there was his name, Don, Don Quixote. Yeah, Don Quixote, who you frequently mention in your novels. He sat it forth as he did because he took the nightly romances for reality. And I determined to take your novels for reality. But I did not let myself become frightened off by anything. My motto has always been forward, even though the world be full of devils.
marvelous, marvelous. What, what you undertake is absolutely marvelous. Sebastian. Sebastian! Sir? Uh, we have to work all night. Uh, offer Mr. Hoffer a cigar. <clears throat> Surely there must be something we can give you a little pleasure with. Brazil? About? No, no, no. no I'll smoke one of my own if you don't mind. Certainly, certainly. You can go now, Sebastian, and uh, take this dagger with you. I don't need it right now, after all. <laughs> certainly, Master. A beautiful piece. I noticed it some time ago. Honored Corpse is the name. Honored Mr. Corpse. <laughs> One push. Somebody's dead. It's extremely well done. Right. Nothing I enjoy so much as a good smoke. Enjoy it, my dear Alpha. Enjoy it. But above all, do go on with your story. Well, it wasn't exactly easy for me to arrive at a solution. So I, I was obliged to perform some extremely detailed analysis. First, I sifted through your novel, Rendezvous Abroad. My first novel, published a few years ago. Awarded the bombing prize related to a film by Hitchcock. All I can say about it is what an achievement. A French adventurer. Fat, tanned, unshaven, with a big, bald head, dissipated, gifted, and a hard drinker, meets a woman, the wife of a German diplomat. Extraordinarily delicate way he has of expressing himself. He entices her to go with him to a run-down hotel in Ankara, filthy hellhole of the worst sort, where he seduces her. Then, taking but then, uh, talking, talking through his alcoholic haze like a Homer, Shakespeare, he convinces her that the highest happiness is in a suicide pact. She believes in the passion that she's experiencing, hypnotized by his outbursts, and kills herself in a sexual fantasy. But he doesn't kill himself. No, indeed. He just lights up a cigarette and walks out. Then he takes a stroll through the slums, beats up a preacher of the Christian mission to the Turks, robs his poor books, makes off for Persia as the door comes up. <laughs> there he goes prospecting for oil. <laughs> yeah, possibly the dismissal of your books is right in calling this a trivial plot. But nevertheless, it leaves Hemingway miles behind in brevity and conciseness. So you're not going to tell me that you took your investigations all the way to Turkey in order to verify this story. Well, I had no alternative. <laughs> <laughs> I went to considerable expense to obtain the anchor in newspapers for 1954, the year in which your novel takes place, and got a Turkish exchange student to go through them with me. And the result? It was the wife of a Swedish diplomat, rather than a German, who committed suicide. A blonde, somewhat reserved beauty. She was found in a hotel of the worst type. No reason for the suicide was discovered, precisely as I had predicted. And the man with whom she went to this hotel? Unknown. The evidence of the desk clock, however, indicates that we're dealing here with a German-speaking individual. I've also established that one of the preachers of the Christian mission to the Turks was indeed beaten up. He was, however, uh, injured too badly to give any evidence about his assailant. After this, I examined Mr. X's board. Churchill's favorite novel. And your second book, a masterpiece. Mr. X. Formerly a good for nothing, but now an established and popular writer, moderator of the American Pan Club, meets a 16 year old girl in San Tropez. He is enchanted by her beauty and simplicity, the intensity of nature, the reflection of the sea, the merciless sun, all combined to bring out his primitive instincts. The result? Rape. Murder in the pouring rain of a tremendous thunderstorm. 
surely the most beautiful and at the same time most horrible pages ever written. The dialogue seems uh, merely sketched out, but it is actually as clear and precise as can be. There's a description of the police procedure. The motorcycles, the radio cars with their screaming sirens, the hunt for the killer, and the suspects who seem to include everyone except the actual murderer. He's too famous and too admired to arouse the slightest suspicion. On, on the contrary, before he leaves for London in order to accept the Lord Byron Prize, Mr. X attends the funeral with a description of which the book ends by the your powerful imagination is getting the better of you, my dear Mr. Hoffman. Ten years ago, in 1957, a 16-year-old girl was raped and murdered in San Tropez. A murder? Unknown. Just like the Swedish woman's murder. Exactly so. Despite an extremely efficient police force. Exactly so. The authorities don't have the slightest clue. Did you make any further discoveries? Oh, um, well, if, if you'd be so good as to glance at this piece of paper. Oh. It is a list of all the people whose uh, connection with characters in your novels I have established. There uh, are, let me see, 22 names on this list. <laughs> Precisely the number of novels you have written. All of these people are dead. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them died because of unexpected accidents, not with the exception of the young English girl who was raped and murdered. Why is there a question mark next to the name of the Argentinian millionaire, Swan? Oh, well, she posed was to the Mercedes, uh, who was strangled by the hero of your novel, Evil Knights. As a matter of fact, however, the millionaire died in Ostend of natural causes. This is a very valuable list. The result of 10 years of criminological investigation. And that is no one either. See, wherever these accidents and suicides occurred, you, my dear sir, were present. Is that a fact? You were in Andrea when the Swedish woman died. You were in San Tropez when the English girl died. You were in all the 20 other places when the 20 other people on that list died. I need only mention the Parliamentary Secretary von Wittgenau in Davos, Countess Vindisprach in Bulez, Lord Liverpool in Split. Everyone on this list, in other words. Everyone. You've been on my track, eh, Mr. Hoffman? I had to follow your tracks if I was going to be a professional detective and not just a dilettante. <laughs> One resort to another, an expensive spa to the next. So it was not merely an idle one, but that would be wherever you were, I was. Wasn't that extremely expensive for you? Oh, ruinously. <laughs> not to mention the fact that my means were extremely limited, my pension, considering the enormous profits of Ursula, Trust and Co., being laughably small. I had to economize. I had to deprive myself of things. Some of my trips on it were dead. Cool. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Some of my trips literally meant starvation for me. The only one I wasn't able to swing at all was the uh, one to South America seven years ago. And, of course, your annual excursions to the African and Indian jungle. Quite unnecessary, my dear Mr. Hoffman. I only hunt tigers and elephants there. At all other times, I stuck to you. That's beginning to be obvious. And wherever we stayed, you in a five-star hotel, me in a shabby rooming house, an accident which you later wrote up as a murder occurred. My dear Hoffman, you are the most remarkable man I ever met. The next question I was faced with, naturally, concern the manner in which this correspondence between your works and realities had come about. Actually, yeah, two possibilities presented themselves to me after I performed the necessary logical examination of the facts. Either you modelled your characters on people you had observed in real life, or your plots 
actually occur in reality precisely the way you describe them. Granted. Yeah, if we grant, if we assume that this second theory is, is true, then your plots, which are universally admired as the products of your inexhaustible imagination, are nothing more nor less than actual accounts. I hesitated a long time before I permitted myself to describe to, to prescribe to this theory. But now, I know it is the only possible one. You see, the thing, this brings up a new problem, however. If your numbers are actual accounts, it follows that the murders you describe are also factual. And that brings us ineluctably to the question, who are the murderers? And what have you discovered? That we must look upon the various murderers as one murderer. All of your protagonists clearly possess characteristics common to one particular person. They are all powerful men with large bull heads. <laughs> usually bare-chested in the critical murder scene. Larger than life in their gestures, they rush through the baroque sea of your prose in a permanent state of semi-intoxication. <laughs> you are a murderer. In other words, you're saying that I have several times. Twenty-one times. 22 times. In 21 times, the Argentinian multimillionaires constitutes an exception. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying, in other words, that I have murdered almost 22 people. That is my firm and immovable conviction. I am in the presence not only of one of the foremost writers, but also of one of the foremost murderers of all time. 22. 21 times. times <laughs> you hear a thing like that. It makes one think, Mr. Monster. Well, what do you really want from me, dear Mr. Hoffman? Now that I've told you the results of our researches, I can breathe again. I often tremble at the thought of this moment, but I have not been disappointed. <laughs> I see you calm still amicably disposed to me and would like to continue speaking with the same terrible frankness to you. By all means. At first, I only intended to hand you over to the forces of justice. Have you changed your mind? I have indeed. <laughs> Why? Well, I've been observing you now for ten years. I've seen how masterfully you have pursued your passion. How carefully you've chosen your victims and how calmly and resignedly you've approached your work. You admire me? Oh, immeasurably. As a murderer or as a writer? Oh. <laughs> about your criminal activities, the more I have learned to value your literary fondness. I am willing and ready to make a supreme sacrifice to your art. Namely, I am prepared to turn my back on the greatest thing in life. I will sacrifice the fame and glory that are due to me. So, you decided not to turn me in? I renounced the opportunity. What do you expect me to give you in return? A small token. <laughs> of appreciation. In what form? Well, you see, I'm bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I've sacrificed everything I own for my art. I'm no longer in a position to lead the kind of life I've become accustomed to while serving the cause of criminological science. I can't afford to roam from one expensive resort to another anymore. <laughs> I shall be obliged to return to Edinburgh near Hall with a cloud over my head and my life in ruins unless... Uh, unless, unless... Go on, go on. Unless you see fit to supplement the pension I get from Ursula Triveston Co. with a little extra pocket money. Say, what, say, six or seven hundred Swiss francs? 
and so on. Mm -hmm. So that I can continue to play a part in your life. I want to speak to you as a natural admirer and confidant. <laughs> My dear Mr. Bert Gott Hofer, I too would like to make a confession. I too would like to speak with terrible frankness, as you put it. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that you are the greatest detective I've ever met. Your criminological talents and your razor sharp mind have not led you astray. You are perfectly right. I confess everything. You admit it? The Swedish woman? The Swedish woman. The young English girl? Her too. Countess Finistrach? Likewise. The Argentinian multi-millionaires as well. I'm oh, sorry, I'm going to lie. My dear sir. Well, you know perfectly well that you're trying to cheat now. Wonderful. Oh, all right, all right. We will fix the multi-millionaires. <laughs> and you did murder the 21 others. All 21. This is the culminating moment of my existence. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> this is the culminating moment of your existence. In a somewhat different sense from the one you intend. Uh, I simply must go back to Papa. Maximilian Friedrich. <laughs> <laughs> Charming daughter of the English girl in the next room fit because you know that they think? To be sure. Your next victim? Ah, my next victim is going to be someone else. Despite the correctness of your conclusions, you have made one mistake, Mr. Holland. Hasn't it occurred to you that it might be dangerous to come and tell me all about your knowledge of my private life? You mean you could kill me? Precisely. Well, naturally that occurred to me, my dear Mr. Corpse. I've examined the situation from every angle and quite quietly and calmly taken every imaginable precaution. A well-known American movie star lives in the room above yours, a colonel in the English army on your left, and a middle-class widow on your right. Excuse me, a widow of duchess. Yeah, incorrect. My investigations reveal that her husband was a department store doorman in Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> the room of no yours is occupied by the tuberculous, tubercular Archbishop of Chernitz. One cry for help from me, and there'll be scandal which will shake the world. So you have to choose, what is the same? What is the good in your world? Right, so, right, so. Ah, oh, so that's why you wouldn't take a drink. Exactly. It wasn't very easy for me to refuse either. I wouldn't be particularly fond of whiskey. You wouldn't smoke a cigar either. Well, after all, you got rid of the tenor Lawrence Hochstrasse with a particularly mild Havana, impregnated with an Indian poison. <laughs> dear fellow, you forget one thing that you come from Ennetlin, near Hawk. Oh, don't underestimate the place. And that bill is very much in the swing of things and has an active cultural life. That's exactly what I mean. <laughs> Nowadays, places that have an active cultural life are on the other side of the moon, so to speak. Otherwise, you would have been aware of the senselessness of your investigations. You don't merely proved something that didn't need proving. You mean? Yes, indeed. For a long time. What you seem to consider your secret has been known by the whole world. That's impossible. Well, I've gone through all the serious newspapers with a fine tooth comb and haven't found the slightest hint of it. The only place you can find the truth nowadays is in the scandal sheets. They're full of my murders. You suppose that the public would swallow my works if they didn't know that I only describe murders that I've committed? But I don't remember us. Corbs is the name. Well, not Mr. Corbs. You'd have been arrested long ago if that were true. But why? Because you're a murderer, of course. A, a, a mass murderer. Well, what of it? We writers have always been monsters. 
according to middle class morality. Look at Goethe, Balzac, Baudelaire, Verlaine, Rambo, Edgar Allan Poe. That is it all. No matter how horrified the world was with us at first, it always wound up worshipping us more and more as time passed. Precisely because we are monsters. We went up and up in the social scale until finally we were held in awe as superior beings. Society has not only accepted us, it has concentrated its interest almost exclusively on our private lives. As people who can permit themselves anything, who are supposed to permit themselves anything, we become wish fulfillment figures for the millions. Our art gives us carte blanche for our vices and our inventions. Do you really suppose I'd have been given the Nobel Prize for my novel, The Murderer and the Child, if I hadn't been a murderer myself? Look at these letters scattered in heaps around the room. They're from high society women, from middle-class wives from chambermaids, all of them offering themselves as victims for my future murders. <laughs> well, then it's high time you woke up. Only critics suppose that a writer works on his literary form, on his dialogue. Real literature has nothing to do with literary matters. Its purpose is to satisfy mankind. People don't long for new literary forms or for linguistic experiments, least of all philosophical revelations. They long for a life that doesn't need hope, because hope doesn't exist anymore. They long for a life overflowing with fulfillment, with tension, with, well, with adventure and the pleasures of the moment, a life that the reality of the machine age can no longer offer them have to turn to art for it. Literature has become a drug, a substitute for a way of life that is no longer possible. But in order to manufacture this drug, writers must unfortunately live the kind of life they describe, something which, believe me, is one hell of a strain. <laughs> After one has passed his particular age, uh, Maximilian Friedrich. Get out of here! <laughs> <laughs> that was the American movie star. When I was young, I concentrated strictly on style. A few provincial editors patted me on the back. Other than that, nobody gave a damn about me. And quite right, too. I gave up the writing. I bumped around, prospecting for oil in Persia. I failed at that, too. Well, that left me with one thing to do. Describe my life. I thought I'd be arrested. The first person to congratulate me and advance me an appreciable sum of money was the Swedish attaché, whose wife I had had an affair with. The story of that affair became my finest and first bestseller. There. And now, do you have a glass of whiskey, since you're particularly fond of it? Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Uh, thank you. As soon as I realized what the world wanted, I began to furnish it with the desired commodity. From then on, I wrote nothing but autobiography. I stopped paying attention to my style in order to write without it. And presto, I had style. So I became famous. My fame forced me to lead an ever more abandoned life because the public wanted to see me in ever more horrifying situations so that it could experience through me everything that was forbidden. And that's how I became a mass murderer. And from then on, everything that happened only increased my fame. My books were impounded and destroyed. The Vatican put me on the index, and the printings became bigger and bigger. And now you show up. You with your ridiculous proofs that my novels describe the truth. 
is the judge or the jury in the world that they pay attention to because the world wants me the way I am. They declare you insane. Just as they declare everyone else who's tried it insane. Do you really suppose you're the first? Mothers, wives, husbands, sons, and all, bursting in on the lawyers, sniffing for revenge. Every single lawsuit has been put off so far. Crown prosecutors and ministers of justice. There's even the President of the United States successfully intervened in the behalf of the name of art. Everyone who's tried to drag me to court has wound up looking like a fool so far. You are an idiot, fear not, Hoffer. You've thrown your savings away. You deserve to be punished for it. Don't expect money from me. You do better to expect something else. Go on. Call for help. Help? I need a new plot. And you plot. <laughs> you are the plot. <laughs> what do you mean? High time I got to work. Yeah, why are you throwing your revolver over the sun? Haven't you figured it out yet? Yeah, I'm coming. I, I, I'm on my way already. I didn't draw the revolver to set you on your way. I drew it to kill you. Yeah, I swear to you, by all I hold home with, I'll leave this place at once and go back to Ennerville. You've given me an idea for a radio play. So <laughs> I can only write down what I have experienced. I don't have any imagination at all. Because <laughs> I can only write down what I experience. I'll make you a part of world literature, fear God, Hofer. Millions will see you standing before me the way you are now, trembling with fright, your eyes and mouth wide open, pits into which cataracts of horror are crashing, opening up before you. You. A mug of a bookkeeper who finally wakes up after endless self-delusion and sees truth tear away the veil. Help! Well, do you see any people rushing in? Is the movie star or the English colonel or possibly the Archbishop of Chernovich springing to the rescue? You? You're a devil! I am an author, and I need money. The radio play which I will write about your murder will be carried on all the networks. I have to kill you with only for financial reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I enjoy doing this? God knows. I'd a thousand times rather drink a bottle of wine with you down in the bar than go bowling with you than spend the night writing the account of your death. No, uh, mercy on it, Master. Forbes is the name. On it, Mr. Corpse. Mercy. The practice of literary <laughs> profession does not involve mercy. Help! You are number 23, Mr. Hoffer. 22! <laughs> Help! Such a bunkler. <laughs> Mr. Corpse, what's happened, Mr. Sick? My visitor jumped off the balcony, Sebastian. <laughs> he seemed to panic all of a sudden. Can't imagine why. Ah, here's the manager. My dear Mr. Corpse, I am desolate. Somebody has been permitted to annoy you. He's lying smashed up among the roses down there. The dormant's been noticing going around like a crazy person for a long time now. Thank God no one was injured by his fall. Kindly of see to it, I'm not disturbed. But of course, my, my dear Mr. Corpse, of course. All right. Let's get to work, Sebastian. But first I believe I'll light up a cigar. I well, like, sir. Use it to burn that piece of paper on the table. What are these names? Oh, just names. Give it here. That's the best way. Thank you. We'll have to hurry. Tomorrow we'll pack. This place has served its purpose. We'll go to Mallorca. Mallorca? A little Mediterranean scenery will do us good. Ready? Ready, sir. Uh, another whiskey first. Here you are.
take this down. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I consider it my duty at the very outset to describe to you the setting of this possibly somewhat peculiar, but I assure you, entirely true story. <laughs> to be sure, there is a considerable element of danger in telling true stories. Someone from the police or possibly even the Crown Prosecutor might be among those present even though they might not be here in their official capacity. Nonetheless, I am not asking to take the risk because I know perfectly well that they won't believe my true story. At least of all. <laughs> Touching. 
and people were, were astonished to find this out in all. Uh, yeah. So, I want to kind of go back to start off yes. with all of that because and sort of gradually re arrive here. But I wanted to start off by asking a bit more about kind of how you came into theatre, what was your personal background and, and uh, your sort of journey? Because you studied it very briefly, but yes, how did that come about? What I think I kind of failed out to it because the thing I, I, I never mastered was, uh, was learning right. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 somebody, if somebody had said to me really, really early, listen, what you have to do is know your lines so well that you can speak them twice as fast as you will ever need them. That's the key to it. If somebody said that to me, I would, but I, I, unlike a lot of um, my fellow students, I haven't really done a good job. I've done, interestingly, um, I did do a drama course at the City Lit, and we were doing a production of Midsummer Night's Dream, I was playing Demetrius. And um, we lost the director. He was, he was a television director and he, he disappeared. And a replacement director was found. And it was Steve Burke. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I think Black, uh, I mean, he was just constantly standing there saying, you know, faster, faster, faster. <laughs> we <don't need> <laughs> uh, and we did that. And um, the show worked very, very well. And I think, I think that set a few. Things, you know. But even prior to that, I mean, where, where were you born and what, and what was your family background? Was there a theatre in that kind of journey? Or? Uh, no, not, not at all. My father was a, a, a mounted policeman. And my mum uh, worked as a, as a uh, sort of kitchen, kitchen skinny for um, a firm somewhere near Hyde Park Corner. So, I mean, the, the family was a bit dysfunctional, really, because my father was very ill. My mum died when I was in college. So, I don't know if I probably didn't come into that. But by the time I, I left college, after being asked to leave several times, <laughs> uh, I, I thought, well, you know, what I really want to do is, is uh, direct, and, and, and so I had to do that. Uh, and the opportunity sort of came. Uh, and I just kind of stuck with it and, 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 and it started to be very, very successful in, 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 in a way that enabled me to carry on. So had you directed then prior to um, forming Solo Theatre? So that was, you were no, not really. Not really. Your own um, company at that point. And at what point did you meet Verity? Uh, in the very early days. Um, uh, I can't remember the exact circumstances where we, I, I, she was working for a media company in Pant. And um, uh, I, what was I doing at the time? Not very much. But um, uh, I, want, I left drama school with the idea that I wanted to, uh, to do theatre and, and Direct. In fact, I I made quite a song and dance about the fact that there, there was no there was no tuition for directing at the college at the time, um, and uh, I, I I kind of felt that, that that's what I wanted to do to direct, and and Verity went along with that because um, she she kind of fancied the idea too, and we were. In a sense, I suppose, objectively, um, a perfect match because um, my thing was just I wanted to direct the plays, choose the plays, direct the plays. And, and she had a skill in PR. Uh, and for um, doing the other side of things. Uh, and she, she developed in a very short time close personal friendships with critics. So that they, you know, they they came and they they were mates, uh, and uh, objectively they wrote objective reviews, but often the reviews were very uh, complimentary, and uh, the, the, the theatre did very well in a uh, comparatively short amount of time. This was not here, 
this was uh, the, the theatre started. Um, I, I did an open air show uh, in the gardens of St Anne's in Soho. St George and the Dragon is a Christmas show, pulling people in, in off the streets as they're shopping, and then doing this ten minute thing, uh, which Kivork was in. Uh, and uh, and then what it has a that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then a basement, which was a I was looking for a venue, uh, a basement in um, Old Con in sorry in New Compton Street, which is now uh, totally demolished. Um, but we did uh, a season of plays there and, and got some attention. And some some of them were no nos, and others were very very successful. Um, like for example. Um, a double bill of, of Fernando Alba, uh, and one one of them was um, was about a, a girl who's going for her first communion, and while this rite is going on, and a woman, uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, surrogate mother, is is explaining what she has to do at uh, the communion, a necrophiliac comes in chasing a coffin uh, with a couple of monks. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, it's a uh, I mean, surreal juxtaposition, uh, making it very clear that the, the church, uh, in certain circumstances, uh, is a monster. Um, there, there was the Arabelle, there was a, a, short, a short radio play by Peter Price, which was uh, set in a circus. Um, uh, ah, yes, the, the very early Ethel Williams play, uh, The Locust Magic. And I was very blessed with a terrific uh, cast. So that, uh, and Nicholas Cotton, for example, said, you know, this play is wonderful, horrific, and wonderful. And you were already known called the Soho Theatre back right from the start. Yeah, of this, of this place yes, to yeah, because we've moved into Soho. I, I found a flat in March Street. Mm. In fact, I'm still moving in Soho. What's Soho like in those days? Ah, well, it was a very, very good character for a while. I, 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 uh, I, I never got involved. <laughs> but uh, it, was a, it was a lively place. and. and to have a lively theatre, lunchtime, and like, I mean, and later we did evening plays as well. Um, you know, it was part of that mix. Mm -hmm. So the sex industry is going on around and sure. and We did it, we even did plays about the sex industry. Right. We did a play at the King's Head, which was the second to a sort of major venue. Um, uh, and one, one of the actresses that was in this with this, with this uh, now, uh, which, um, well, it just dealt with the sex industry, and what you saw was backstage of this other strip club, and the action on stage, the, the acts with the with the music, mm -hmm. uh, and then back to the, and there was also a, a ghastly torture sequence, uh, which was meant to be a kind of. Is that Dynamo? That's the first time. And the extraordinary thing about when, it, when we came to do it, because the audience is fantastic, but the first performance, you went into the King's Head, there was nobody on the bar. They had all come back to see uh, back, uh, it, uh, the stage, the back, uh, the restaurant, it converted it into the theatre. At the back, and so nobody was serving. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go. So, with this first space that you had on the Compton Street, what was it like when walking? Was it another basement? It was a, it was a, a pretty, pretty, pretty ghastly uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> restaurant space. Uh, so, you see, you know, the walls were red, and there, there was a kind of station <laughs> you could use. It was being rented by a man who was a musician, and he was a soul Chinese instrument. Very interested in, in uh, melding um, uh, Western music and Western musical instruments to Chinese music. 
Roman Roman lands, maybe it was. And we had it at a, on an hourly rate. <laughs> uh, and we um, uh, did a number of shows there. Uh, and they worked very, very well. But then it was time to move on. And they, was, so the, rest, the restaurant was operating upstairs and then you did the shows downstairs? No, the, the, uh, uh, no, the restaurant was open in the evenings downstairs. So, because, so there are some lunch time theatres, you could actually buy the lunch on the same premises. Indeed, and that was, the, that was the big bonus coming here. Because um, we, and the voters were very keen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we, we sold um, a slip of bread and coffee. Mm -hmm. and that would be on top of the ticket price or, or included. I know some places you could buy the kind of package deal, I think at the little theatre where the theatre scope was, but here you'd kind of pay for a ticket and then... The, 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 the meal was very cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and was it served in this space then? Um, well, where the back row is, there was, there was a, uh, an erected uh, area through which there was a, uh, a, a viewing hole for the lighting control. So the lighting was in there, and the kitchen was in there as well. There was a hatchway in here. And so you've got your soup and your rolls and whatever here through the hatch, um, and then brought, brought into the auditorium. And I might add that, very importantly, there were small, well, they started off as very, very large tables from the poly, and our wonderful designer who designed the service, commandeered these tables, cut off the legs, so they served as rostra, so that uh, you didn't have the sight problem some of you had it back here today. Um, so I'm sort of imagining very deep buying vegetables down at Derrick Street Market and a super she, had a, she had a thing for making a marvellous liver pate as well, and this was also sold um, very cheaply to, to um, uh, my clients. So I'm going to do this bit of profit from, from that, and I'm interested in the funding, how you actually both from the, the uh, other space on the Compton Street and then at the King's Head and then here. How were the, at what point did you stop getting funding and how much did you generate from box office and so forth? How did it all work as a puzzle in the room? I Money was hard to come up. In, in fact, at one, uh, one point, uh, I think the very team took a couple of things from the supermarket um, and was uh, was caught and uh, ended up in court and was given some money from the poor box. From the poor box, yeah. So recognition of starving artists. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> But uh, I mean, no, we we got there, we got by. But uh, uh, it was never the intention to uh, to make to make money. But uh, we did we did get uh, small grants from uh, the Arts Council constantly uh, for new uh, new plays because there were new plays, uh, and uh, eventually we we got um, an annual grants, which became healthier and healthier as time came by. Yeah. And so in, from that you were able to pay yourself as, as artistic director at that point and Verity as what was she a producer or um, an admin manager, what was her official I don't know how we did it. I I, I, we, we just concentrated on doing the plays. <coughs> uh, and I, my, even my memory of that plan is, is non-existent or dim. Right. <laughs> um, do you, you paid equity rates because it's so no. good during that period? No, no, no. Okay. Um, mm, I, would, I would say pretty well everybody that came down here got nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they, uh, they got fares. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if that, if that was a necessity. Um, because I, I saw that the state of the profession was such that actors needed to be seen. They knew that. They knew uh, if they could be seen working, and better still, if they could get nice reviews. But this was uh, a productive and important exercise for them. And that, that sounds um, uh, sort of opportun opportunistic, but it just was the reality. And how would we pay actors anyway? I think you know, I mean, the prices of the tickets were ridiculous because I had this other ideal that um, it would be wonderful to get office workers from the area seeing that something unusual was happening here and come in and not have to pay very much. This was, this was a, you know, a, 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 like a social, a social experiment. Uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, why shouldn't people um, come and see theatre for the first time and, and, and find it challenging and interesting and uh, I suppose the classic word nowadays would be disruptive. <laughs> so how successful do you think you were in that? Because I know some, uh, Arts Council, the Arts Council stopped funding some um, large town theatres because they thought, well, they weren't actually bringing in a new audience. They weren't yeah. necessarily doing technical. No, I think they did that. I think they were always friends of cast uh, among the audience, honestly. But I think, I, well, I know that there were also people that uh, lived or worked locally. Um, uh, yeah. And but so ah, and uh, yeah. it was to, it was to do with the with the other theatres and to do with Brew. Yeah. Better. Uh, our our principal at drama school, who uh, and I was, I was uh, in a way bad news for her because I I didn't I didn't really fit in at all. And she asked me to leave um, uh, a couple of times, and I did stay on. And in the last year, uh, I, was, I, I was put in charge of stage management for a production of Anna, Anna Frank, which is loaded with props and loads of sound effects and all these things I had to, I had to do. And uh, I learned a lot from that because, you know, when, you're, when you, you've got a deadline and you've got to produce all, the, all this stuff, the, the props and everything else, uh, uh, something is learned. And I learned um, at Brews a number of things. I learned about um, front of house uh, and that everything to do with the theatre uh, must be right. The standards, because many of the fringe theatres theat theat at the time I visited, a number of them, were very scruffy. Uh, and the shows didn't start on time, uh, or you know the front of house photos were, were non-existent, uh, or, or the, the quality of the design or lack of design was sometimes appalling, and uh, was like shooting themselves in the in the foot. Uh, and and I discovered uh, without realising it at at college that these things, everything to do with the the way that it looked front of house, in the, your, your photos, uh, the way that um, uh, the audience is treated, um, the way that they can sit in comfort and, and watch a play, and if something is advertised to happen, it actually does happen. All these factors are part of being professional. Mm. So you've had good quality photos, you've got the reviewers in, so the actors have part of that pack. You have good quality food available on the side. Absolutely. They've got the package and yeah. a good experience. That's right. That's right. Uh, and I, I, I felt that was important, and that's something that I picked up. I think, um, you know, just through the course of PR, yes, it's a Yeah, yeah. One, one more question. I just wanted to ask you a bit about it because I think the first show that happened here was the trial of. Oh, yes, 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 it was. Kind of very much linked to the kind of climate at the time and the, the Oz trial and so on. Can you say a little bit about that? Just because it puts us within that moment. Yes. Well, Colin was, was living in um, Islington. <coughs> and he, 
and he'd known about us uh, from the King's Head, what we were doing at the King's Head. Um, and I think, um, along with his partner, uh, I remember his name a bit, but was it Bob Smosh? Uh, they, they saw that this, this was an opportunity that he could, he could get the player on here and he could get reviews. And he said to me one day, yeah, you know, uh, would you like to look at the script and see whether you would like to do this? And he said, by the way, uh, Nigel Hawthorne would like to do the judge. <laughs> <laughs> and what was, tell us a little bit about that play. Well, it was, it was based on the Oz trial, and about this character, you know, uh, an ordinary bloke uh, who uh, he's in court because his wife has died, died of fright. Um, uh, and in, in fact, she's died of fright because he, he's had an erection. <laughs> and she, she thinks it's a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> The judge was rather like the judge in the actual Oz trial, coming up with all kinds of amazing questions to try and figure out what is going on. Um, so it was uh, a fun story, <laughs> but Nigel was brilliant. So it's clearly a lot more repertoire <laughs> 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 Yes, I'm sorry to, to sort of bring things to a close because, it, as you Can say, there is. Yes, of course. Yeah. Exactly. Just yeah. um, a sort of plug for unfinished histories. Mm -hmm. In that, um, so as Matt said, we uh, record oral histories of the alternative theatre movement and um, we also collect the archive of the alternative theatre movement. So we've got a substantial archive at the British Escape Institute. Um, and on the 10th of December, Monday the 10th of December, we've got an event happening at Southwark Playhouse, which is a benefit for Unfinished Histories because we haven't got any funding, um, which is going to be a celebration of the 50th anniversary, it's a year full of anniversaries, of the end of theatre censorship, which was the context out of which a lot of this explosion of new work that happened at 68 onwards came. So we're going to do um, a stage reading, but very much workshopped and brought to life of the Rasputin show by Michael Almas, which um, bright in combination with the kind of up and running arts labs at the time transferred to the Arts Theatre in 1968. So if you're interested in seeing, re-experiencing more of the, this period, um, uh, then please come along and you can find it out on Solid Playhouse website. So thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Plant elsewhere. At the same time, some of the things that um, Trent was talking about disruption earlier on. I think disruption is a very trendy academic word at the moment. It also to be a very spot on word in many ways. Um, and it's quite useful to think of it within the context of our university as a whole and some of the other cultural things that took place and are taking place. Um, the poly, as was Polytechnic Central London or Regent Street Polytechnic uh, back in the day. Um, was a really sort of well-known student um, music venue back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, we make a big play at the fact that um, Jimi Hendrix got on stage for the first time in the room next door with Cream back in 1968, and The Who played, and Fleetwood Mac played, and all these sort of things. But um, this space 
as well as being a theatre, is actually really important outside the theatre in all sorts of other ways. Um, somewhere in this room, we're not quite sure where, um, an early version of Pink Floyd used to rehearse. Uh, Nick Mason and Roger Waters were both students, and um, I took Nick Mason down, and he, I couldn't really trust his memory, because he's a little bit adult, I think, but he's, he seems to remember rehearsing. <laughs> um, we, had, we had lots of photographs that he thought was there, and um, Sid Barrett, who was known as uh, Roger then, his real name was Roger, used to come down here and used to jam. So that's one part of it. But also, um, this was the space where the Poly Folk Club took place. Now, the stage was over here for the theatre with Fred and Verity. Actually, when Poly Folk took place, it was over in that corner, and the band used to play over there. And um, we've recently got hold of a number of um, people who are part of that club and talk about some fantastic stories of um, people like Sheila MacDonald, Ralph McTell playing down here, or Paul Simon walking down those stairs, he was staying in Hampstead, and walked down those stairs to he didn't play, but he went to watch the bands taking place. And actually, part of this disruption that Fred talked about, um, there's something very magical about these sort of events that took place. And we've started putting on what we've called ghost gigs, or found sounds, playing some of the, um, playing some of the recordings of performances that took place in the spaces they took place. So we did one for Fleetwood Mac earlier in the year, uh, who played 50 years ago in the main room over there. We've got one coming up in uh, next month. There's some posters at the back. Uh, I keep getting it straight. It's called a, Disru a disruption. Uh, New Order, the uh, seminal post-punk band New Order, who rose out of the ashes of Joy Division. Um, they played in uh, our new Cavendish Street site back on the 6th of December 1985, and we've got a disruptive event. Capturing the spirit of Lunchtime Theatre and disrupting time and space, putting on that event in a new Cavendish Street on the 6th of December. You're all more than welcome to come along and um, experience that if you wish. Uh, we hope to do some other disruptive events in the future, including uh, Sheila, McDon uh, Sheila McDonald, uh, who performed here in 1971. Uh, we're hoping to get her to come back and do a performance here again, so we're working on that. Um, yeah, I mean, to bottle the spirit of the place, to carry on the sort of stuff that Fred did all those years ago, and Verity did, and all the others, um, and all the stuff that... I'm sure it does. Yeah. Yeah. All credit to Matt for bringing this back alive, and bringing it back to the fore, because it was uh, occluded before. And um, our vice chancellor's left now, so I can't even crawl to him about it. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, he, he's given me his credit for a lot of um, effort and stuff. And invite you to disrupt your Friday afternoon with a glass of wine over there. Please fill in those forms. Please talk. Please wander around. Look at the fantastic photos by Nobby Clark. And some other bits and pieces around here as well. We'd love to look at. But thank you all for coming. And uh, come again. Thank you.